Good morning, and welcome to the second day of the Patent Literacy Symposium. My name is Dr. Pam Kastner, and I have the honor of serving as Patent State Lead for Literacy. At Patent, we are fully committed to the science of literacy and the right of every child to literacy. Everything we do at Patent is grounded in the theoretical frameworks that underpin the science of reading and the science of literacy. In fact, this very symposium is grounded in Scarborough's Reading Rote. We were honored to have the eminent Dr. Jack Fletcher as our keynote speaker yesterday, and we are duly honored today to have Dr. Louisa Motes as our keynote speaker. Dr. Louisa Motes holds a very special place in so many people's hearts and minds for literacy, especially at Patton. Dr. Motes is the author of Letters, Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling, and Pennsylvania is honored to say that we have the most letters trainers in the country, all trained at Patton. Dr. Motes has contributed immeasurably to literacy and it is truly our honor to have her as our keynote speaker and in the session following up. Let me share a bit with you about Dr. Louisa Motes. Dr. Louisa Motes has been a teacher, psychologist, researcher, graduate school faculty member, and author of many influential scientific journal articles, books, and policy papers on the topics of reading, spelling, language, and teacher preparation. After a first job as a neuropsychology technician, she became a teacher of students with learning and reading difficulties, earning her master's degree at Peabody College of Vanderbilt. Later, after realizing how little she understood about teaching reading, she earned a doctorate in reading and human development from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Dr. Motes spent the next 15 years in private practice as a licensed psychologist in Vermont, specializing in evaluation and consultation with individuals of all ages and walks of life who experience reading, writing, and language difficulties. At the time, she trained psychology interns in Dartmouth Medical School Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Motes spent one year as a resident expert for the California Reading Initiative, four years as site director of the NICHTI Early Interventions Project in Washington, DC, and 10 years as research advisor and consultant with SOPRIS Learning, obtaining two small business innovation research grants from NICHTI. Dr. Motes is most well known for her research and writing about the needs for improvements in teacher education. Her most recent publications have focused on helping teachers understand the language basis for reading and writing. They include Letters, Professional Development, Voyager SOPRIS, Language, Live, Blended Literacy Intervention, and Speech to Print, Language Essentials for Teachers, her third edition just recently released, as well as a series of articles and books for the International Dyslexia Association. And just this past week, she re-released an updated Teaching Reading is Rocket Science. We are so honored to welcome Dr. Louisa Motes as our keynote speaker today. Dr. Motes? Here we go. Are we in business now? We're in business. All right, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm taking this opportunity today because um, I know there are so many people in Pennsylvania and elsewhere who are who have heard me speak before. And I thought maybe this morning I will backtrack a bit and talk about the most fundamental idea that has compelled my work for decades now. And that is that uh, teaching reading involves respect for and awareness of the fact that print represents speech. Now, this sounds absolutely fundamental, and everybody may be thinking, well, of course. And yet, as I watch what goes on in reading instruction, it seems to me that while this is absolutely fundamental to what we do, it is often very underappreciated. So what I will be speaking to you about is what this means to me, this idea of speech to print, reading's most important idea, and the difference between instruction that is motivated by awareness of speech to print and instruction that is not. And then I will wind up with um, a reminder of how we may um, uh, employ consciousness of this basic idea in what everything we do day to day. So let's start with this. Um, 
You know, I went for many years as a teacher without really thinking about this. And when I heard a talk by Isabel Lieberman from uh, the Haskins Laboratories at Yale, when I was uh, finishing my graduate program, I thought, well, of course, but no one had reminded me of this fact before. And that is that human beings have uh, been able to communicate through spoken language for at least 100,000 years. Of course, nobody knows exactly how many. And the first writing systems uh, were developed uh, way later than humans developed speech, perhaps about 10,000 years before the modern age. And those first writing systems were logographic. They represented concrete meanings that could be interpreted um, as um, and representations of things that were tangible um, or visible. And then gradually the print systems moved toward more abstract representations. And about 5,000 years ago, the first alphabetic writing was generated uh, by Semitic traders in the Middle East. But this is a very late human discovery, the idea that we can use written symbols to represent the segments of speech. And now there are other major alphabets in use across the world. The, the, the Roman alphabet that we use in English writing is only one. Uh, these are four of the other major alphabets and they look very different, don't they? So this is just to remind us that these squiggles we have on the page are abstract and meaningless and arbitrary representations of spoken language. Another fact about the way we write and the way we represent English is that we do not have a system whereby a single letter represents a speech sound for the most part. And if we look at how each of these vowel sounds in English are represented, we can see that we have multiple representations for each of these vowel sounds, I, O, A, E, U, and U. And let's take U, for example, we have a single letter here in Ruby, two letters in root, uh, two letters separated by a consonant in rude, two letters together in true, two letters together in suit, two letters together in chew, and two letters together in soup. And um, uh, actually the norm in English writing is to use not only single letters, but letter combinations to represent phonemes. And here uh, in height and though and nay, we have four letter combinations that represent single vowel sounds. And here IGH is a three letter combination that represents uh, a speech sound. So the first fiction that we communicate to ourselves and to our students is that single letters represent speech sounds because by and large, um, the representational system we use involves single letters and letter combinations. So <clears throat> phoneme graphing correspondences are um, are the bedrock system by which we represent spoken language in English. And this is also the bedrock psychological uh, achievement that allows us to be able to read in alphabetic orthography. And again, in the case of English, we look at um, how we represent each of these words. Um, it is a combination of single letters and letter combinations that represent the individual sounds. What I've done here is to use a box for each phoneme in each of these words. And what we have to teach kids is to not only look at the single letters, but also to develop automatic recognition of common letter combinations that represent single sounds. And if I could go to the word string, st, er, e, and ng are the graphemes that represent the phonemes in that word. Um, 
NG, and these are things that I did not learn readily until I was really in my doctoral program. I went through my early work as a teacher, not being fully conscious of how the system was working. For example, I did not know how to teach this letter combination NG as a representation of a third nasal sound in English, mm. Um, I, for example, would teach kids that ING was a combination, but not with full, all the information, which is that rep, that combination represents two speech sounds, I and N, combined to make um, a common uh, pattern in English. So another reality of English is that it is morphophonemic. It represents sound, meaning, and function. This too, I was unaware of and didn't appreciate until my doctoral program. So our print system can represent words that are related to one another like equal, equality, inequitable, and equanimity. And it is that letter combination uh, uh, embedded in these words that we learn to read as uh, a meaningful sequence that represents um, the, the base of a word that may have prefixes and suffixes attached, but with combinations like define, definition, definitive, indefinite, what I want you to notice is that um, <clears throat> this uh, uh, word we begin with, define, is pronounced somewhat differently in these other derived words. And we do not change the way we represent F-I-N, for example, uh, each time that we shift the pronunciation or make a phonological shift in the derived form of the word. Here's another example, describe, description, indescribable. Here's another example, divide, division, indivisible, divisive, and I think I have another virus, a word of the day, uh, related to virulent and viral, not the same as virile, and virulence. So as we learn to read, our eye learns to interpret these letter sequences as representations of meaningful parts of words. And as we develop skill in that, our word recognition is uh, facilitated and becomes more and more automatic and allows us to make a direct link between how the word looks and the meanings that are embedded within it. So uh, here's a little experiment to bring this home for all of you. I want you to pay attention now. I'm going to show you something for about two seconds and I want you to remember what I show you. Here we go. Okay, did you get it? Can you repeat that back to me? Well, probably not. Perhaps you can tell me what some of the letters were, but it was not a recognizable word. Here we go, ready? Could you remember that? Well, maybe that was a little bit easier. And here we go. Now notice, that when you saw that third word, you recognized it instantly. There was no delay in your processing of the word because you already know it. And it's deeply embedded in your lexicon and probably for most of you, you have what we call a high quality representation of that word in your mental dictionary. And you process that word without any intermediate process of trying to figure out a pronunciation. You already know the word. And what do you know about it if you know it well? You know it's morphemes. You've recognized bene as a Latin uh, 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 prefix for good or well. And you recognize uh, F-I-C as uh, the part that means to make, to make good. And you recognize the suffix al. And you probably, this when you saw this word, it triggered in your brain automatically words that were related to it, like benefit and beneficiary and beneficent. Um, and you know in your mental dictionary that its grammatical function is to uh, describe another word or condition, and you also have recognized syllables, which are not the same as its morphemes, 
And in order to do that, you've recognized its graphemes. And in this case, the CI represents the phoneme sh as we pronounce that word. Um, and in order to ha have learned the graphemes, you have somewhere along the way processed the phonological representation of the word, its pronunciation, um, and now we have uh, sound uh, uh, spelling and uh, meaning embedded in our mental dictionaries, all of which enable us to recognize that word with no delay whatsoever. Now, um, often we talk about the science of reading, and to me, the best representation of the science of reading as we know it now comes from this map that Reed Lyon put together when he was the director of the NICHD uh, research program in reading. And uh, these are uh, the major research centers that have been funded uh, for decades, many of them still receiving funding from the National Institutes of Health. But I want to point us to the work, uh, back to the work of the Haskins Labs uh, at, associated with Yale here. And of course, Dr. Fletcher has headed up uh, for decades the, um, the research center at uh, the University of Texas Houston, and now uh, his affiliation is with the University of Houston, but that's where we work together on the project located in Washington. But anyway, back to the Haskins lab, the, the work there for really five decades has informed everything that I think about day to day. So um, in putting this together, I asked myself, well, what were the basic discoveries and when did they occur and how did they inform our work? And how durable have those insights been over decades? So um, uh, as I reread some of the early work and history of the early work, I realized that it was in the early 1970s that they, um, the group there generated this idea, this discovery, this insight that poor reading and good reading both are parasitic on speech. Uh, Dr. Fletcher uh, mentioned that yesterday and that means that um, uh, uh, what we learn uh, is dependent on what we process in spoken language. Reading depends on language processes primarily. Written words are not learned or remembered, quote, by sight. And this fundamental insight that was promoted in the early work in the 1970s just now really is being broadly appreciated in our discussions about what we have learned from decades of research. Experiments show that word pronunciation is activated in the brain even when we are reading silently and quickly. It is an illusion that we uh, bypass pronunciation and re read words by sight even when we are reading them automatically. Phonemes are learned and stored in memory by their articulatory properties, not merely by their acoustic properties. And uh, this means now that uh, as we teach phonemes and phonological awareness to kids, we are beginning really broadly to respect this insight that the, the researchers at Haskins uh, knew fully uh, decades ago. And conscious analysis of phonemes in words, that is phoneme awareness, is necessary for proficient use of an alphabet. And while this, you know, again, this was presented to me in the late 1970s when the first papers by Haskins were published, and then the, in the next decade, uh, there were many experiments showing how important it was to bring conscious awareness of phonemes to children as we were teaching them. We still have only about half the institutions who train teachers give teachers a grounding in what this means. And when we look at what goes on in kindergarten classrooms and preschool classrooms, we still see many that are not even teaching phoneme awareness in a conscious, deliberate way, which is rather shocking to me. Um, and another insight that came very early from the Haskins researchers 
was that children's reading and spelling errors are linguistic in nature. They are not visual in nature. And some of the evidence for this was that they discovered very early, for example, that vowels as a class of phonemes were misread and misspelled much more often than consonants. So that points to the linguistic nature of what's going on. Similarities in the features of phonemes account for the majority of confusions and errors in reading and spelling. And errors are not just acoustic but they or, or visual, but they are phonetic. And that means that in the subjects they were working with very early, there were there was no evidence for a fundamental problem with auditory processing or hearing, rather the, the problems kids were having were fundamentally due to their misperception of the phonetic and phonological properties of words. And then we had to ask, and this is still underappreciated, we had to ask, well, why was it that phonemes, there's something about phonemes that were difficult for kids to get, right? And so as Dr. Fletcher presented yesterday, um, uh, reading and spelling problems uh, originate with problems in the phonological um, aspect of language, but why? Uh, so this quote is extremely important for everyone to understand, and it is that children faced with the task of learning to read in an alphabetic script cannot be assumed to understand that letters represent phonemes because awareness of the phoneme as a linguistic object is not part of their easily accessible mental calculus and because its existence is obscured by the physical properties of the speech stream. <clears throat> so what does this mean? It means that if we look at a spectrogram of a, a speaker pronouncing words that all begin with so-called short a, ah, what we see is that what is coming out of our mouths, the frequencies that are coming out of their mouths and the way those speech sounds are linked together uh, look very different. And I thank my colleague Ann Whitney for providing us with this, um, with these spectrograms of the pronunciation of alligator, animal, and apple. And what is different? The first sound, an alligator, uh, at, is not really separated from the ooh that follows it. Those, uh, that liquid ooh is blended with the vowel sound. Um, there's very little separation. You don't see separate speech sounds uh, uh, that are distinctly um, apart from one another in an alligator. And it's even more so with animal, where the nasal, mm, the consonant that follows ah, um, is blended into uh, the sounds that precede and follow it. But it is in apple that there is kind of a space here, this, this, these frequencies or absence of frequencies here. This is a division or a sort of stop in the vocal stream that separates ah from the p that follows it, this, the voiceless stop that follows the ah. And that's why we say when we're talking about um, good uh, uh, key words for kids who are trying to learn to separate the speech sounds and words, let's give them some help and give them a word in which that first sound ah does exist kind of in, in a separate form from the rest of the word and uh, this is a much better keyword than animal, where the nasal um, quality of the n is spread into the vowel and uh, uh, is linked also to the sounds that follow. So some of the realities of speech are that phonemes are co-articulated, smooshed together in spoken words. That makes them hard to separate psychologically. Phonemes are shaped by the phonemes that surround them. Uh, variations of phonemes are called allophones, but we can still identify them in the context of speech because what our brain is, is learning as we learn phoneme awareness is the abstract properties of classes or groups of phonemes that are distinguished by articulatory features, by the properties of speech. And these confusable phonemes have similar articulatory 
phonemes, that is uh, all the nasals, for example, go through the nose, uh, m, mm, n, mm, and m mm are confusable because they all go through the nose um, and are continuous. Uh, the phonemes ch and j are articulated similar, similarly, we call them affricates. And uh, what is different is something we call voicing. So if we look at the consonant chart, and this is something that all the people who've had letters understand and the letters trainers understand, that uh, the reason we learn the speech sound chart is that uh, we should look for the, the confusable nature of phonemes that are, this is, these are all the consonants that are lined up uh, together in a column or that are lined up in a row. So for example, t, d, n, s, n, z are all pronounced with a tongue behind the teeth or we call them alveolar consonants. T, d, n, s, z. If you say those, you can feel that your tongue is behind the teeth. And these phonemes are inherently somewhat confusable because of the similarity of articulation. And when we teach, we need to respect the fact that students might confuse these t and d uh, because, and they diff they're, they're different because of voicing, and they might confuse z that are different because of voicing, and they may even confuse n along with these others or have difficulty separating out these phonemes from one another if they exist in a cluster. And so here's exhibit A. This is a first grader being asked to watch, uh, being asked to write, sorry, uh, uh, something about uh, what he or she likes. And this student writes, I like something. And what is that word? These others are, I like birds, I like dogs, I like cats, I like kittens. So we might infer that this is an animal. What is it? Well, the word is elephants. And what I want you to appreciate about this early spelling is that the word elephants has a consonant cluster on the end, n, t, and s. And for this student, just learning how to write a long word, that cluster of consonants is smushed together and is represented by one letter, the letter Z, but you can see that n, t, and z, or s, the plural, are lined up together in the mouth. And this would be a cluster that is very difficult or it's an advanced skill for this student to learn to take apart that cluster of consonants that are articulated in the same position in a mouth. And as far as that student is concerned, this is sufficient for representing what is on the end of that word, elephants. So uh, this is very uh, typical of what kids do as they are developing phoneme awareness. Um, so one of the ways that I learned to appreciate what students are up against as they develop phoneme awareness is uh, I, I developed a passion for looking at kids' spellings because they were such sensible representations of what is in speech. And I learned early on, I did my dissertation on this, um, uh, what kids believe uh, is uh, in each spoken word is a pretty accurate representation of what exactly we are saying when we say words like tray, troubles, and dragon, where the initial sound is in fact affricated and is like, in this case, the ch um, in the beginning of the word. That's a good representation. Uh, when we say ladder and letter and water, what we're doing in the middle of that word is called a uh, an intervocalic flap or tongue flap. It's very akin to the sound d. Uh, when we say <clears throat> words like jump and add an end and elephants and um, uh, uh, other words that have a nasal embedded between a vowel and a stop consonant, 
Well, what happens? The nasal does disappear in articulation and children are showing us that with their spelling attempts. Um, when they spell little and bigger and open, in fact, they're not leaving out a vowel, they are representing the final syllable with what we call a syllabic consonant. And when they spell walked and dogs, uh, uh, they are spelling phonetically what we are actually saying, which is very good. And when they're writing words like soon and goat and boy, where the vowel is elongated, children like to show that with more letters um, that are representing what our mouths are doing. So uh, when, when we teach kids about vowels, for example, uh, and also consonants, uh, we need to emphasize articulatory detail. Um, the vowels in English are not the letters A, E, I, O, and U. The vowels in English are speech sounds E, E, A, E, a, I, A, A, O, 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 U, and U, and Oi, and Ow, and Er, R, Or, uh, Schwa flutes in the middle. It's not a phoneme. It's a, it's a, uh, <clears throat> it's a, a phonetic. Uh, it's an allophone of vowels. But we need to make kids aware of it, <clears throat> and um, by looking at at how vowels are articulated, we can anticipate that ah uh and uh might be confusable and that the long vowels i is near in articulation to ah uh and uh and that kids might um, need to straighten these sounds out and uh, we can look at then the spellings the early spellings of kids so for example chunk uh, the uh and ah uh are confused in this student's early spelling attempts um, but yet the student knows the letter O for, for the O in coach, which is very good. And here we have um, the student using the letter I for the ah sound in mob. The student doesn't know how to spell short O yet, but is sort of reaching for logical spelling by feeling in the mouth how the uh, vowel sound I, uh, uh, might be close in articulation to ob. So I see this as uh, a sensible choice for a student who is trying to relate what he knows about letter name, uh, letter names and their sounds with what he is being asked to spell um, uh, and doesn't quite know how that works. Uh, I did a study with uh, Marie Kassar, Rebecca Treeman, and a couple of other researchers a while back in which I really could observe and could see in our data on student spelling and the relationship between their phonological awareness and spelling, the truth of this statement that we made in the article. Phonology, although important for all aspects of literacy learning, is even more critical in learning to spell than in learning to read. Orthographic knowledge is laid over a phonological foundation. If that phonological foundation is weak, orthographic skills cannot develop sufficiently to support good spelling and compensate for the underdeveloped phonological skills. And we've seen this also in other studies uh, based on our uh, DC project where uh, spelling outcomes are even more closely related to uh, kids scores on phonological awareness than word recognition in some cases. So how does poor phonology sabotage printed word memory? Well, this is how it works. The anchors or parking spots for graphemes in our mental dictionaries are, are the phonemes in the spoken word to which graphemes are mapped. If those anchor phonemes are incomplete or unclear or misidentified, there's no Velcro to attach the, voc the, the graphemes to. The result is students attempting to memorize letter sequences 
by visual imprinting or by using extraneous information such as configuration or context. And back to our experiment with word recognition that I inflicted on you earlier, when I showed you this, the only recourse you had, because it's not a pronounceable sequence, was for you to struggle to try and remember that letter sequence by rote uh, through sort of visual memory. But when I showed you a pronounceable non-word, you probably then immediately turned to um, a, a pronounceable uh, uh, or pronunciation as a strategy, nibble, facey maybe, and not nibble, right? If you know your phonics. But when I showed you beneficial, there was no delay, right? You, you instantly recognize that because you've already attached the pronunciation of the word to its orthographic form. But you did not recall it simply as a rote letter sequence like this. So um, what is the evidence now um, that if we teach kids how, um, uh, how to spell or encode words during our reading lessons, that we get a better result than if we just have them try to recognize words visually. Well, one of the key sources of evidence was from um, Beverly Weiser's dissertation and a paper that she published with her dissertation advisor, Pat Mathis in 2011, when they did a, what's it called, a best ever synthesis of all the studies comparing encoding instruction in first grade with uh, decoding only. In other words, they looked at studies that included spelling or encoding in the lesson sequence with decoding only. And they found effect sizes favoring the inclusion of encoding in beginning reading lessons. Uh, the growth impact on um, outcomes was significant for all of these other variables, for phoneme awareness, spelling, decoding, reading fluency, comprehension, and writing in the first graders in, uh, in this synthesis. Uh, awareness of the internal structure of words what also in another uh, uh, a couple of studies by Tangle and Blackman um, translated into significantly greater sophistication in spelling and spelling practice in turn affected reading growth in their landmark work <clears throat> way back. And encoding requires complete analysis of the internal details of a word's phonemes and morphemes. That's why it has an impact on reading. And most recently, this study uh, recently published has, um, has verified that spelling practice results in higher quality orthographic memories. That is what we store in our word form areas in the brain. And when we have higher quality orthographic memories, that those in turn facilitate word recognition speed in reading. So um, the theoretical foundations that have been laid for several decades now are sort of coming home to roost when we have this evidence that a high quality mental representation of a word, which can be bolstered by having to encode it and spell it as we learn it, uh, bolsters reading fluency. <clears throat> These things are all related. Now, how do we get there? How do we achieve that? This is where Linnea Aries work uh, over decades has been so informative. And we can see if we look at spelling development over time, which I've been able to do as a clinician, if you follow kids over time and you give them the same spelling test over time, you can see readily how uh, Linnea Erie's uh, phases play out uh, in word recognition and spelling development. 
Uh, so gradually, as phoneme awareness develops, kids go through these phases, and each one of these phases is dependent on uh, better, more, um, more elaborated ability to separate the phonemes and words, which in, in turn facilitates the ability to match graphemes to those phonemes in orthographic memory. Uh, now, let's have a look at the difference between approaching the teaching of reading and spelling as a print to speech exercise, which is widely, I mean, this is the tradition in what we do. And if we shift a little bit toward a speech to print orientation, what difference does it make? <clears throat> well, the scope and sequence of what we teach will then be determined in, in the early phases of teaching will be informed by the features of phonemes uh, and, the, and, and our need to teach according to the phonemes that kids might confuse. So we might separate out uh, those uh, uh, speech sound and uh, letter, letter and grapheme relationships that could be easily confused. Uh, versus uh, looking at visual similarities like B and D, for example. Uh, the reference point for lesson design and concept presentation would be to begin with awareness of speech, with spoken language. Have kids say the sounds, have kids say the words that are learning to pronounce, have the kids examine what might be similar and different about both speech sounds and words in which they are embedded versus just looking at letters. And we will choose keywords and, and cue cards and, and make sound walls according to the array of speech sounds that kids have to learn um, rather than just looking first at the written symbols. Uh, so, for example, getting detailed here uh, with a speech to print orientation, we define a consonant as a phoneme that is formed with an obstruction of the flow of air or a closed sound. English has 25 consonants. We define a vowel as an open phoneme, the nucleus of every syllable, and we show kids that English has 15 to 18 vowels, depending on which ones you want to teach, plus schwa. We teach, for example, that a vowel team is a grapheme or representation of a single phoneme. Uh, um, and we demystify these letter combinations as representing single speech sounds. Now, a traditional print speech orientation, which is very common, uh, uh, teaches kids that consonants are any letter of the alphabet except A, E, I, O, and U. Teaches that a vowel is a letter, A, E, I, O, U, uh, and sometimes Y, sometimes W. Um, and teaches that a vowel digraph, for example, is two adjacent vowels in the same syllable making one vowel sound. Now, um, this is a di subtle difference in terminology, but I would never say that there are two adjacent vowels in the same syllable because a syllable has one vowel sound in it. That's what it is. Now, an example of a program that uh, is a speech to print orientation is Janine Heron's uh, Talking Fingers that she designed to teach four and five-year-olds about the speech to print system. And she teaches a uh, spelling for each vowel and consonant phoneme um, and uses a picture mnemonic to uh, teach kids how to remember the letters and letter combinations that represent each target phoneme. <clears throat> This is in contrast, this is the teacher's college workshop material where um, kids are not taught that vowels are a class of speech sounds, but they are taught to um, put, uh, to look at their uh, names in writing and to identify uh, where the vowel letters occur. 
Now I would ask you, what is misleading about this? What is uninformative about this? And I have to give you the answer because we're not all together. But it's that there's no information about the speech to print relationship and looking for letters in, uh, in names uh, gives you no information about how they are used to represent speech. I think I'll skip this one for the sake of time and move on to this. Okay, some of the, now this is just, um, uh, I took these statements uh, written in black from a, a, a well done uh, print to speech program, again, to highlight some of the differences. If you tell kids that vowels can be short or long, uh, you've omitted information right from the get-go about diphthongs, oi and ow, about the vowels a and u uh, that are perfectly good vowels, and vowel r combinations. If you tell kids that vowels followed by r in a syllable do not have their long or short vowel sound, then uh, what are kids supposed to think uh, when they read words here, here, care, core, pure, fire, that do have long vowel sounds in them, even though they're followed by the phoneme uh, er or r. Vowel digraphs usually have the long sound of the first letter uh, I, I saw in a good uh, print-to-speech program. However, that is just not true. What about out and auto and peace and few and pray and bread? Well, that's simply not true. It's a fiction. Uh, what about telling kids that some vowel digraphs have two spelling for the same vowel sound? Well, that's confusing because a vowel digraph is something in print. It is not the same thing as a speech sound. So it makes more sense to say we have these, um, we have these sounds, uh, these vowels that are represented by two letter combinations or three letter combinations or even four letter combinations. Um, but the vowel sounds are single vowel sounds. So I'm, I'm just showing these common sorts of statements in traditional phonics oriented or print to speech programs that simply don't add up. And, and traditionally, uh, th these, these statements have been there to help make sense out of the system, only when you really look at it, uh, it doesn't really make sense because the logic of uh, writing is that it was created to represent speech in the beginning. Okay, we, we created all of these ways to spell each of the vowel sounds in English. And this is all very teachable. We can teach kids all of the vowel sounds, and we can teach them gradually a way of representing each of the vowel sounds. So, uh, for example, I love this photograph of a first grade classroom. Uh, uh, Lynn Kuhn provided me with this photograph of a classroom, I, I think in Colorado, uh, where the teacher took this information to heart and created a sound wall and was very generous about what she, the information she provided. And isn't it beautiful that we can show kids what they have to learn, just as we show them the multiplication table, for example. This is less information than a multiplication table, and we can lay it all out. These are the sounds. Some of them are short sounds with red arrows. Some of them are long vowel sounds, and some of them are neither. I want to show you a video. This was just um, recorded uh, by Mary Dahlgren, my colleague, as she was working with uh, a great teacher. I'm sorry, I haven't met her yet. Working with a first grade classroom in Alabama. And I, what I want you to see is how excited these kids are as they are learning to, to um, give out in, in speech vocally what it is they are going to be learning about uh, vowel sound. So let's watch and hope it works. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. Talk. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, of course they are learning to spell those sounds as well, but they know what print represents. They have the anchor for what print represents. And, um, and what you can see is how excited those kids are to discover all of this and how they're using their mirrors and how, um, how excited they are that they have made this discovery about the relationship between print and speech. Um, now, when it comes to teaching how print works, uh, the other thing we have to keep in mind is what I presented in the beginning, which is that print represents much more than phoneme, grapheme, correspondences, and all of these aspects of our orthography need to be taught as well as phoneme, grapheme, correspondences, um, as we make sense of uh, print for kids. Um, in addition, not only do they have to learn to read the words, but of course, beyond word knowledge, comprehension is going to depend on linguistic awareness at other levels, beginning with sentences and then on into connected text and the relationships among sentences within paragraphs and the organization of longer segments of text. But consider this, what is it that the kids are going to have to learn to do as they become proficient readers? This is a sentence from a Faulkner novel. This is for the high schoolers. He made the journey in his truck carrying with him since the truck it had a housed in body with a door at the rear was new and he did not intend to drive faster than 15 miles an hour, camping equipment to save on hotels. Now what, you know, who carried? What did he carry? Why did he carry? How did he carry that? So the function of words and sentences are going to be another level of linguistic awareness that can be supported by constantly um, uh, working uh, uh, the, the processing of spoken language uh, with the processing of written language. Um, uh, reading instruction should never be quiet. There should always be speech, uh, production of speech, listening to speech, um, and connecting uh, reading and speaking uh, vocally with making sense of the print. So I will sum up with this. Reading and spelling depend on linguistic skills. Reading and spelling are parasitic on speech, but demand deeper levels of linguistic awareness than speaking does. 
Phonological awareness, which is an oral language skill, is critical for reading and spelling in an alphabetic writing system. We have, going back to 1970-71, ample evidence that this is the case. Spelling or encoding practice builds knowledge of phonemes, syllables, and morphemes, as well as specialized memory for orthographic units in the brain's word form area. Um, and so what is structured language and literacy all about? Um, it's all about teaching an emphasis on language structure, which is much more effective than, than rote methods. And again, we have decades of evidence that this is the case. And in order to um, teach effectively uh, with this consciousness of um, connecting speech with print, teachers have to know language. And there is evidence now, a very recent study by Linnea Erie and one of her associates that teachers, they've proven that teachers at the second and third grade level who have better knowledge of language are more effective, especially with poor spellers who depend on instruction. And this is the case all the way down the line. It's the poor readers and spellers or the lower half of the distribution, especially whose learning of literacy will depend so much on the teacher's ability to communicate what our print system is representing. So that brings me back to my um, song and dance, which is um, teacher knowledge is essential. There is no substitute for a teacher having a very comfortable relationship with the language uh, that they are teaching. So to conclude, teacher knowledge is critical. Teacher training programs must include knowledge of reading psychology, language structure, and research aligned methods. Teacher reading is complex. It takes time and lots of learning to become an expert. And I thank you, especially all of you leaders at Patton who have made a commitment uh, uh, to teacher education on behalf of our students and our society. And let's remember this, why literacy is so critical. And I love this quote from Anna Quinlan, books are the means to immortality. Through them, we all experience other times, other places, other lives. We manage to become much more than our own selves. So I have a short reference list here for you to pursue. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. Uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you so very much, Dr. Moch. You continue to honor us and inspire us with all that you teach us. Thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Motes uh, will be uh, having a session at 9.45 for those of you that have registered. Uh, all sessions do begin again at 9.45 and we look forward to seeing you there. Take care. Bye-bye.